We get to only focus on God's presence with us. Not because we have summoned God to be here, but because God is always with us. And sometimes we forget that. So as you breathe deep this morning, just remember, the Spirit is alive and moving among you. And that is all that we need to worry about in this moment. For the last few weeks in worship, we've been talking about Mr. Rogers and his TV show that ran for decades on public television. Whenever Mr. Rogers gathered people together in a room, he had them take a moment of silence to remember and to be grateful for all the people in their lives who had gotten them to the point that they were. So I invite you this morning to take a moment of silence and to think about, to give gratitude to all of the people in your life, in this week, in this day, that have helped you, given you grace, and gotten you to this space today. We give thanks to God for those people. In the same way, I would invite you to take a minute to be grateful and to thank God for God's grace and love and presence in your life that has gotten you to this moment in this space. God, we praise you and we thank you for the ability to worship you today, for being in each other's presence and for all of the people and the gratitudes we have that have brought us into this moment. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and it is in his most holy name that we pray. Amen.
please join me in the prayer of confession. God of many pastures, your spirit calls us to reach out and proclaim the good news where bandits and thieves seek to lead your sheep astray. Forgive us, source of comfort and strength, when we seek to keep your care for ourselves, believing that we alone have a special place in your love. Call us once more, loving shepherd, to lay our burdens down and rest, that we might have the strength to open our eyes and see the needs of your flocks all around us. Amen. Even when our own hearts condemn us, God is greater than our thoughts and our hearts. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the pasture of the Lord's love forever. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to invite the kids to come up this morning for a minute. Charlie, how are you? Hi, Jackson. Hi, Henry. How are you guys? Could you hold this for me this morning? Thank you so much. Um, it's so good to see all you guys this morning. How are you? Good. Good. That's awesome. I wanted to ask you something. Um, how? <laughs> Siri thought I was asking her a question. How? <laughs> how do you tell people that you love them? What do you say? You can, you can hug them. You can, but how do you speak it? What do you say when you love somebody? I love you, right? Right, that's how we usually say it. I love you. Is that what you guys say? Yeah? You don't? I'm not even going to ask. What do, you <laughs> what do you guys say? Do you say I love you? Okay, when we love somebody, we say I love you, right? How do we show it? If we can't, what if your lips were sewn together and you couldn't say I love you? And then what would you do? What if your moms or your dads or whatever, what would you, what would you do? Um, hmm. Yeah, what, how, if, if we couldn't speak, if we couldn't talk, how would we tell somebody that we loved them? How would we show them that we loved them? Or you could buy them a gift that they want. Yeah, you could give them candy, right? You could um, you could buy them a gift. What else? You could bring people that need clothes. You could bring them clothes. Oh, you could bring people that need clothes, clothes. Yes. What if somebody was hungry? How would you show somebody that was hungry how you love them? What do you think? Give them food. You could give them food, right? What else? Do you have any other ideas? What if somebody was lonely? How would we show somebody that's lonely how we love them? Maybe you say that they like, can stay at your house overnight. Oh, great. We could just be friends with them, right? They could come visit us. Those are really great ways. Today in, um, in worship, the scripture says that it's cool to tell people you love them, but we can't just say it. We have to show it. And all of the ways that you just said by um, giving people things they need and maybe giving them hugs and being friends with them are all great ways that we show them we love them. Sound good? I think that's pretty awesome too. I'm going to give you these cards and during worship, this says love in action. So this reminds us, you can take one down and pass it. I'm going to give one to everybody. During worship, you can draw away. Do you want one, Charlie? There you go. You want one too? There you go, buddy. You can draw away to show somebody that you love them. And you can take your, you can decide how you're going to do that, okay? Okay, you can decide. I'm going to share with your cousin. There you go. And how many we got? Did we get everybody? Okay, so whatever you draw on the card that you're going to show someone how you love them this week, I want to see it later. Will you show it to me after worship? Mm, maybe. Okay, 
Okay, somebody, Grace is going to. You're going to show me after worship? Okay. All right, let's pray. And then you can have one of these treats, right? Because oh. <laughs> everybody's high in it. Oh, I know, Neil brought them for us. Isn't that so awesome? Yeah. Okay, let's pray together, shall we? You repeat after me. Dear God, thank you so much for loving us and help us to show your love, show your love to other people. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. Here you go. This is really why you come see me, isn't it? Thanks for coming up. Yeah, you can keep that.
Let us pray together. Gracious God, we pray that you would open our ears, our minds, our hearts, our whole selves, so that we might receive your message and hear your word. It might fall upon our hearts without resistance. We might know that this message is for us, and we might be aware of your spirit moving us to do better, to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, in the ways that we act and treat each other, and especially in the ways that we love. It is in his most holy name that we pray. Amen. In 1972, 30,000 people went to Washington to protest President Nixon's policies on welfare and education and child care. And many of those 30,000 people marching were children. Funding was being cut and insufficient aid was being given to those that were in poverty at the time. Nixon had also taken a very public stance on the issue of those in poverty and cited publicly that there were moral differences, he believed, in people that were considered poor and those who were considered not. He publicly spoke and categorized people that were poor as not having the same work ethic, being lazy and irresponsible, and just unwilling to work. Thankfully, there were also some people who were fighting against that judgment, and one of those, as you can probably guess, was Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers was very big on charitable giving, probably because his entire life he had been shown that by his parents from an early age and through teachers at his seminaries that he went to. His mother was known for constantly cooking meals and taking them to people in need and offering her help wherever it was needed. His parents were both very big contributors to their home church, and his father was especially vocal that at the end of the year, if the church still had money in the bank account, the church had not done its job that year. Rogers did a lot of charitable work, but he especially focused on the needs of hungry children, children who were hungry because they were living in poverty. And once again, as we have seen week after week, he used his TV show to make an enormous statement about that and in opposition to what was going on in the world. While Nixon was saying his rhetoric in public and taking away aid from the, those who needed it most, Rogers spent a week, that same week, on TV addressing poverty in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. He brought a new character to the show in this week called Mr. April, who was a magician. Mr. April had come to Mr. Rogers' TV show to show his magic, but he finds his way into the land of make-believe where he tells Lady Aberlene that unless something happens, he is very desperate and he needs to sell all of his magician tools just to buy food for his family. Lady Aberlene says, please don't do that, and tells him just to hold on a little while while she can find him some help. Lady Aberlene goes to take up the issue with King Friday. Wink, wink, Mr. Rogers. King Friday is the governing body of make-believe land. And as she pleads her case to please help Mr. April with his needs, King Friday in his robe and his crown and his castles says, Lady Aberlene is just being very dramatic. Just then, Mr. April walks by in a blazer carrying a bag of groceries, showing no signs of poverty and is in a very big hurry. He tells King Friday and Lady Aberlene that um, it is he's going to feed his family breakfast. To which King Friday is dismayed and says, it is in the middle of the afternoon. Why is he only feeding his family breakfast now? Mr. April says, it is our first meal of the day. 
Rogers was giving a not-so-subtle hint that poverty consumes people's days and disrupts their entire schedules. After he leaves, an argument breaks out between King Friday and Lady Aberline because King Friday says clearly Mr. Apel is dressed and carrying groceries and has no need. They do not know that he has already sold his things to buy his family food. Back in the real house where Mr. Rogers is doing the show, he speaks to kids about how parents feel very disappointed when they can't provide the things that their kids need, when they work hard and they still can't provide what their kids need and sometimes what they want. And it doesn't make parents lazy or irresponsible or unwilling to work. He preaches in a direct opposition to what people are hearing in the world at the time. This is not the only time Mr. Rogers will tackle the, the issue of poverty. He spends pretty much all of the 80s talking about this issue, especially in 1984 when he takes on again President Reagan because President Reagan has put together a task force to search for hunger in America and comes back and says, we just can't find any. Rogers spent a lot of time combating harmful statements around poverty and also harmful ideas that if we can't see it or it's not happening to us, then it must not be that bad. Why does he spend so much time tackling the issue of poverty and getting people the help that they need. I think it was because of his faith. Mr. Rogers grew up with models of the faith, showing him how to take care of those in need, and then he in turn takes Jesus' mandate to love and care for others very seriously. By this, Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples if you love each other. They will know you are my followers if you love each other. It's hard for people to know exactly what we're feeling inside, but it's not hard for people to see how we act. Our love cannot just be a feeling. It must also be put in action in the ways that we live and especially in the ways that we care for each other. If you have a spouse or a parent, or even a friend, or just someone in your life who tells you that they love you, but their actions do not show you that they love you, do you feel loved? If someone tells you that they love you, but they don't spend time with you, they don't have conversation with you, they ignore your basic needs, do you feel loved if they merely tell you? If we have children in our lives, in any capacity, and we tell them that we love them, but we do not take care of their basic needs, do you think they feel loved? How about in the world, as Christians? If we tell people that we love them, we love all people, but we don't feed them, and we don't give them a drink, and we don't visit them, do you think they still feel loved because we said it out loud? There's some scripture in 1 John chapter 3 that I want you to hear. John says this, This is how we have come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. This is how we know what love is. This is how we have experienced what love is. Christ sacrificed his love for us, his life for us. He didn't just tell us, he showed us, he sacrificed. And so this is why we should sacrificially live for others and not just be out for ourselves. If you see someone in need and you have the means to do something about it, but you turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears and you made it disappear. There's a lot of easier versions to read of this scripture that do not feel so convicting, but I chose this one because it stings a little, a lot. 
If you see someone in need and you have the means to do something about it and you don't, you have made God's love disappear. This is incredibly convicting. We know what God's love is because God has shown it to us. God has not just told us God loves us. God has, and we know that. God has also shown us through grace and forgiveness and through the life and the sacrifice of Christ. But what if God only said, I love you? What if it was only written in the scriptures? What if we were never shown? What if we were never forgiven? What if we never received grace? What if Christ never died on the cross and rose again? How much more real and tangible and deep is God's love? Because God doesn't just tell us, God also shows us. John says it matters. It matters how we show people that we love them. Not just tell them, but show them. And we're not talking about the people that you already love. And we're not talking about buying more gifts for people. We are talking about the people that we say that we love because we love everybody. We're talking about those people. If we are followers of Christ, we try to do what Christ did. And Christ did not walk around to people and say, bless you, bless you, hope that leprosy gets better, hope you get better, hope you feel better, hope somebody comes and spends time with you. He went and loved people in action. He spent time with them, he talked to them, he had them pull seats up to his table, he ate dinner with them. He spent time with them. He didn't just tell them he loved them. He showed them. If it is our goal for people to know that God loves them, then as followers of Christ and people who are going to continue to spread love in the world, we cannot say it only. We must show it. If we withhold the resources that we have to help other people in need, we are withholding love. The world is full of people who need love. The world is full of people who are starving. One in five children under the age of five right now in America rely on WIC to support their development. America reports over 580,000 people as homeless. In America, we now classify loneliness as an epidemic. America boasts the second largest prison population in the world at 1.68 million people. 38 million people last year, so I have to imagine this is much higher this year, fell below the poverty threshold, which is a mere $29,000 for four people. 11 million of those people are children. There is no shortage of needs to be met in America. And we have means to help. We cannot help everybody, but that doesn't mean that we cannot help somebody. John said if we have the resources, if we have time, if we have money, if we can give our presence, if we can give our talents and our gifts, And we don't. We withhold God's love. What will we do with God's love today? I want you to say this with me. This is a quote um, from John Wesley, who founded United Methodism. And it was one of his favorite things to say. Join me. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you and we thank you for the ways that you show your love to us over and over again, a love that is so abundant and never-ending that it's hard to wrap our minds around sometimes. As you fill us and remind us of that love, God, we ask for you to forgive us for all of the ways that we have continued to withhold our love from other people. 
that we have held on tightly to our own things and had a mindset of never enough instead of your goodness and abundance. Strengthen us to be the people that go out and show your love in all of the ways that we can to your people. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who made love real for us, and we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, I'm going to invite you to take a few moments to praise God through your tithes and offerings this morning. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. As you have filled our cups with love, O God, quench the thirst of those yearning for this love through the gifts we bring this day. As you have fed us with the bread of eternal life, feed the needs of your world. With these gifts we return to you. Amen.
Today, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. And all of this is God's gift to us offered without price. Yes, we are happy to have both. So to Stormy and the parents and the sponsors of Baker, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as Lord, in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. Will you nurture this child and Stormy in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say, I will. I will. Now I ask the whole church, as you also take part in these vows, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service to others. We will pray for them. We will be tr true disciples and walk in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray responsively. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you sent in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them through freedom through the sea of Egypt. You also brought children through the Jordan into the land that you promised, and so as your children we say, sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit, and he called his disciples to share in the baptism and the death and resurrection to make disciples of all nations. Declare Christ's work to the nations, his glory among all the people. God, we pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit out upon this water as a gift to those who receive it, to wash away sin, to clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, and that dying and being raised with Christ, they share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with you and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Amen. Will you let me hold him, do you think? Can I hold you? Hi. He's like, I don't know. You want to touch the water? Oh, it's so fun. Yes. <laughs> Baker Martin Miller, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Baker, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, it is our joy now to welcome Baker and his mother in Christ. Please join me. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as members of the family of Christ. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons, Stormy and Baker, to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ. We renew our covenant to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please welcome Stormy and Baker to your church family. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, can we sing the song while Baker takes a walk down the aisle? This one. There we go. We're going to wave at all the people. Say hi, everybody. Say hi. See, they say hi. There you go. And say hi to these people. <laughs> Thank you so much.
also have a gift for Baker. Don't let me forget to give you that on behalf of the whole church. So what a great celebration this morning. Thank you for letting us be a part of that, guys. Do we have announcements that we need to share with each other this morning? We do. Jackson, what are they? <laughs> None now. Are there any other announcements? November 4th, starting at 5, is the date for fall dinner and pie auction. Other announcements? Yes? Awesome. New Scouts, see Rick. Friends, you have made this day special. By just you being you, there is no person in the whole world like you, and I like you just the way you are. Just saying goodbye to all the people online before I show you a, vi a video. <laughs> you good? All right. You know, my mother used to say a long time ago whenever there would be any really cat catastrophe that was on the, in the movies or, or on the air she would say always look for the helpers there, were, there will always be helpers you know even just on the sidelines that's why I think that if news programs could make a conscious effort of showing rescue teams, of, of showing who uh, medical people, anybody who is coming into a place where there's a tragedy, to be, to be sure that they include that. Because if you look for the helpers, you'll know that there's hope. Peace be with you. Please come and share some cake for Stormy and Baker's celebration. Amen. <laughs>